My name is Ronald Hutton, and I'm a professor of history at Bristol University and a commissioner of English heritage. All my life I've had a passion for museums, and in this new series I'm going to take you to a few of my own favourite little hidden gems. So whether it's ancient Egypt, Victorian London, or even human remains that pique your interest, I hope that this cornucopia of curiosities will tickle your fancy as much as it has done mine. Hello and welcome to the programme. This time we're at the Jeffrey Museum, set in one of the largest surviving almshouses of old London. Opened in 1714 in what was then a semi-rural suburb and now an oasis of calm amid the bustle of ultra-trendy Hoxton in the east of the city. And housing the Museum of Domestic Life. The almshouses were founded in 1714 with a bequest from Sir Robert Jeffrey, a wealthy London merchant, to provide homes for the elderly poor. There were 14 houses in all, which offered accommodation for around 50 pensioners. Each house had four rooms, and the pensioners were allocated one room each. It was functional and austere, but much better than being on the streets. The museum's curator, Eleanor John, took me into one of the restored almshouses, laid out just as it would have been 200 years ago. So the almshouses are opened in 1714, but this room is, we present it in the 1780s, so a little while the foundation had been open for a number of years. And what we try to do here is we try to recreate the space as authentically as possible. And one of the things we did was paint analysis, microscopic paint analysis, of all the painted architectural surface, surfaces. And then looking under that under a microscope, we could establish what colours tended to be used. And the colours that come through very strongly for most of the period that the almshouses are open are stones and buffs and greys. And in this particular room, we've got the panelling is painted with oil paint. We had it specially made up. All the pigments that are used are natural, ones that would have been used at the time and had been used on the almshouses. The walls are um, distemper, which is a um, chalk, water and animal glue, and again with some pigment. And then the ceiling is just what's called whitening, which is just um, chalk and water. What sort of people would live in a place like this? Well, the, um, it was four people over the age of 55, and the descriptions that you get is that they have to be of a proper character you know, and a proper object of charity, so clean living. They gave priority to people who'd been in part of the Ironmongers' company, but also people who were non-free of the company were, were here as well. So you might have two people in a room, and this is what we're ma imagining in this space, is that there's a married couple here. Very occasionally as well during the 18th century, you get people with children in the foundation as well, living in this space. And in this space, what you have to do, you have to do everything. It's sleeping, being, sitting, cooking, and yes, and eating. And then there's a little food preparation room through here, a closet, where um, the pensioners have a dresser, and it's where they would have prepared their, their food. That's really very cosy. That, that works extremely well. It's clean and it's comfy, it's well appointed. Yes, yes, and it was one of the rules actually that the arms people had to abide by was to keep their house sweet, sweet smelling and, you know, keep it clean. That's the way it was described. They had to brush out every, every week or whatever. Can you show me here? Yes, let's go upstairs to um, the 19th century, the room we've displayed as if it were 19th century. And as we go up, we can admire again the traditional paint that we've used here and the liveliness that you get with the distemper. It's much less flat than an emulsion. So let's come through to this room, which is displayed as if it were the 1880s. My immediate reaction is it's much more ornate. Even the chamber pot is decorated. 
Indeed, yes. And I think two things have happened here, really. I mean, there is generally, by this period, much more stuff, much more stuff for people to buy. But also the social profile of the pensioners changes over the 19th century. So from the 1840s, you need to have five shillings a week guaranteed to be able to come and live here, as well as taking the ironmonger's um, pension. So that's one of the things that has changed. And we find also that it's more people, less of the local tradespeople coming to live here, and there tends to be more sort of middle-class people coming in who've perhaps worked as companions or governesses or schoolmistresses, and then they've fallen on hard times. And what we know from the records of people who visited almshouses at this period is that there was a mass of stuff in them that people had brought with them, the things they had collected over their lives. And they're sort of sometimes described as people's memory bits. And they tend to be clustered round the fireplace and on the surfaces. There's the proverbial Victorian gaslight. Does it actually work? Yes, it does. And this is something we were very keen to do, so that because we'd use these um, authentic paints, to make sure all the lighting in here is um, authentic as possible. So gaslighting was installed in the almshouses from the 1880s. And I think one of the things was, it doesn't have a glowing incandescent mantle at this stage. And one of the problems is you get this flickering flame that could have caused headaches. And I think there were, the fumes could be quite noxious. But actually, you know, more convenient, it gives off 10 times more light than a candle. So very, very useful. And over here? Yeah. So we have a washstand, so this would have um, been somewhere where the, obviously the arms people would have do, done their personal washing. Again, as in the 18th century, everything had to take place in the same room. They had no um, extra space um, for eating or washing. In its compact kind of homely way, it's not dissimilar to a person's room and an old person's home at the present day. No, not Except at all. Except that yeah. for the time, it seems a lot more upmarket than most. Yes, yes, I think it would have, would have been really quite a comfortable existence here for the people, you know, a very good place to live. And there were many people petitioning to, to get into the almshouses. They weren't ever short of people. Like any museum, there is much more in storage than on display. And the Jeffrey is no exception, with thousands of items locked away. Ella led me down into the underworld of the museum to get a look at its state-of-the-art vaults. Right, so let's look at some stuff, some of the hidden treasures in our, in our store. Now, the thing under here is truly, truly exceptional. This is an early 18th century easy chair, and it survives with this original upholstery intact. And that's from top to bottom, so it's these covers right through into the webbing underneath, so everything's intact. And, and chairs of this type simply don't survive with their original upholstery like this. Grander easy chairs do, which have more expensive upholstery, but something modest like this, which is essentially a uh, linen, um, a wool stamped with, you can see with this waved pattern. Can you just about see that? Yes. And if you look here, it's got two. So there's this waved pattern and then this sort of rippled effect. And I think the idea is it's meant to be um, copying moiréd or watered silk. Do you know that sort of effect? It's a very, very successful effect. Yes. And I think it would have been good in um, candlelight. Yes. And yes. Particularly good in candlelight. Yes, I can imagine being seated in that with a gloss of claret and a church warden pipe. One of the really interesting hidden spaces at the museum are, is our storeroom, where we, um, we have about a thousand objects on display, but we actually have 25,000 items in the collection. Um, so in our stores, we have a whole range of material. The things we tend to collect are things that would have been found in um, middle-class living rooms. So anything from a carpet to a television, to a record player, to a video. So a whole range of material. 
Over here, there's something I really want to show you, some of the special things that the museum collects. Here, for example, is a drawing book put together by somebody called Miss Shapter. It was Mary Gibbs Shapter, and she lived at 7 Clarendon Place in Hyde Park. Um, very upmarket. Yes, it is very upmarket. Oh, that's exquisite. Yes, yeah, she does these fantastic little drawings of, of the house. She lists all the pieces out, and what's going on here is that we have a before, the room in 1900, and here it is in 1909, so she's documenting the changes that she's having made to the rooms. And There's a particularly um, beautiful little bit here where she's put in what was called a cosy corner. So here you see it before, and then lift the flap, and there it is after with a corner sofa put in next to the fireplace, which was something particularly that being done at the beginning, beginning of the 20th century. And then let's move on to some other material that we're, we're interesting, just interested in, just to show you the sort of range of material that we collect. And here... Teddy bears. We have, yes, a wonderful teddy. Now, the really exciting thing about this teddy on the right is that we um, got it from the original owner. It was bought for a little boy called Dudley, who lived in South Edmonton, and it was bought by his godmother for him in 1909, and it um, was bought from Gamages. Oh. And he's a stived teddy. He's a particularly nice one. He's mohair. And one of the really wonderful details about him, can you see his snout has been shaved, so he's got a bristly snout. Yes, he's a very upmarket teddy indeed. Yes. A deluxe teddy. Yeah. So, let's move on and look at some more material. We'll open up the rolling racking, which is now standard in museums for storage. It makes the best use of the space. I want to show you a particular picture that we have. It's a fairly recent acquisition which was very kindly given to us by the artist, Frank Stanton. And he um, was one of the early gentrifiers, if you like, of Islington. Oh, he yes. moved, there, <coughs> excuse me, moved there in the 60s with his partner and set up, was one of the first to set up an antique um, shop there. So he was, he, they were antique traders. And this is their first floor front room on Islington High Street. This defines an era for Islington. Yes. Indeed, for yes. London yes. aesthetic society. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank and, you. And um, thinking about the aesthetic of the thing, one of the things we have is that we have a piece of the wallpaper as well. So along with the painting, we acquired a piece of the wallpaper shown in the room. It's this marvellous um, flock. Oh, that is 60s, glorious. Sort of blue ground, yes. green wool flock on it. Yes. And I think, you know, it's particularly useful for the museum. So we've got the painting, we've got the actual wallpaper shown in the painting, and we also have an interview with the artist himself. So we've gone the whole hog on it. The Jeffrey Museum opened in 1914, specialising in the history of the English domestic interior. It explores the history of English homes and gardens over the past 400 years with recreated interiors down through those ages. What we do here is that we display a series of period rooms which show the main living spaces of middling Londoners' homes. And of course, what space though that is changes over time. So we're here in 1630. This room would have been in a timber-framed house with casement windows, and it's called a hall. And it's the main living space at this date in a middling, middling London, in London house. So the all-purpose room and the family bit of the house, and the rest is bedrooms and storage yeah. The other parts of the house is you might have a parlour, which is fairly similarly furnished, same sort of stuff, but perhaps a little bit more private. The idea of this space, and then you've got bed chambers higher up or chambers higher up in the house that can act as private sitting rooms. And you might have a shop on the ground floor and a kitchen behind that. So if we move through, and we're arriving in 1695 here. William of Orange. Indeed. So what's, what's going on at this point? Middling homes have changed dramatically during the period. The hall has gone. 
disappears, that communal space, that space for the whole household seems to go. And it's replaced by two rooms, the dining room and the parlour carries on. And we're showing a parlour here, but I think it's very significant that this new room, the dining room, emerges in the 1650s. I really do feel as I've emerged from the end of the Middle Ages yes. into the beginning of the modern period exactly. between those two rooms. Exactly, exactly. I think that's exactly what's going on. The furnishings are particularly different because you have a suite of chairs rather than joint stools and um, great yeah. chair. So it's a kind of less hierarchical situation. Now we're moving through now into 1745 and the big changes here are the, are the is the use of mahogany really is one of the main things. So you can see the, the tax is lifted on mahogany in the 1720s and it becomes much more available. And um, here you can see what's called a pillar and claw table and it tips up so it's a very neat piece that can be put away at the side of the room very good for taking tea. Tea is well established as something done in these homes as a social activity and what's important about taking tea at this date is that you have the right stuff is that you have tea bowls a teapot teaspoons a moat spoon so that it's all and you know how to have, have to know how to use that stuff. And all in porcelain. Yes in um, imported porcelain at this wow. date. So all the way from China. Gosh the chapel. And here we are in the chapel. Now this room was just referred to as the great room. That's how it was conceptualised. It was probably a meeting space and also a sociable space perhaps for the pensioners. But in 1716, so two years after the almshouses have opened, you, we, there's records of them trying to raise funds to convert this to a chapel, to, to um, have the pulpit fitted and these box pews and these are the originals and they survive intact the apse was added you can probably tell by the architecture was added in the 1780s 1790s and coming to services here was a condition of residence it was it was you had to either go to a church service somewhere else or get to the chapel every sunday if you didn't you were fined i may be being too generous but i imagine that if you're a poor person of good character in old age, uh, religion could be quite comforting rather than a chore. Yes, I, I would imagine so. The objects which have caught my eye today are all Georgian, reflecting the highest period of the almshouse's life. Starting with a pair of earthenware flower horns from around 1740. We presume that they were made for putting flowers in and that they be put up on the wall, but we've actually never seen a picture of these in action, and so we're not exactly sure how they worked. And from exquisite things to a domestic shambles, a satirical print, 1795, sold commercially, showing an unseemly brawl between two servants over a Christmas pie. One of them's the cook, the other's a lout who's gone over, set it, the dog's now eating it, the servants are fighting, she's putting some pie upon his nose, the dog will then bite it, which it does, and the squire is looking on at this disgraceful sight and enjoying the spectacle of a couple of peasants having a punch-up. Very edifying. To a better run kitchen, we have that of Anne Dawson. This is her recipe book from 1724. And you can actually hear her voice. In her inscription at the beginning, she says, if she loses this book, anybody finds it, would they be coined enough to return it to her, C-O-I-N-D. And finally, the most precious object of all, a teapot, obviously, of Chinese blue and white porcelain from the wreck of a Chinese ship which went down when it caught fire round about 1725 and sank off the southern tip of Vietnam. The cargo was salvaged in 1998 with 138,000 pieces of China and this duly came to the Jeffrey Museum as a classic example of the kind of thing on which the fashionable English upper and middle classes would have set their hearts in the 1720s to take tea with their friends. And on that deliciously enduring domestic note, I end this connection.
Sir Robert Jeffrey and his wife are buried out in the gardens, presumably so he can still keep an eye on proceedings. Also outside is the charming herb garden, home to all manner of curiously named plants and herbs. And it's out here in these fragrant gardens that I really start to appreciate the beauty of this location and why it's so unique today. Here I am, just a few hundred yards from the hustle and bustle of Hoxton and Shoreditch, right on the edge of the city of London. And yet we are in an oasis of calm and tranquility, as relevant today as it was 300 years ago. It's been delightful to spend a programme concerned with such pleasant things, with charity, generosity, the care for the poor, and above all, with those everyday household objects which bring comfort and joy and a sense of the familiar to us all. See you next time. Goodbye. Subterfuge, sex and scandal tonight as we reassess the life of one of the most enigmatic royals of the Victorian age, Prince Eddie, the king we never had at ten, after more brand new curiosities from Professor Hutton, next on Yesterday. And what we try to do here is we try to recreate the space as authentically as possible. And one of the things we did was paint analysis, microscopic paint analysis of all the painted architectural surfaces. And then looking under that under a microscope, we could establish what colours tended to be used. And the colours that come through very strongly for most of the period that the almshouses are open are stones and buffs and greys. And in this particular room, we've got the panelling is painted with oil paint. We had it specially made up. All the pigments that are used are natural, ones that would have been used at the time and had been used on the almshouses. The walls are um, distemper, which is a um, chalk, water and animal glue, and again with some pigment. And then the ceiling is just what's called whitening, which is just um, chalk and water. What sort of people would live in a place like this? Well, the... Um, it was four people over the age of 55, and the descriptions that you get is that they have to be of a proper character, you know, and a proper object of charity, so clean living. They gave priority to people who'd been in part of the Ironmongers' company, but also people who were non-free non of the company were, were here as well. So you might have two people in a room, and this is what we're ma imagining in this space, is that there's a married couple here. Very occasionally as well during the 18th century, you get people with children in the foundation as well, living in this space. And in this space, what you have to do, you have to do everything. It's sleeping, being, sitting, cooking, and yes, and eating. And then there's a little food preparation room through here, a closet, where um, the pensioners have a dresser, and it's where they would have prepared their, their food. That's really very cosy. That, that works extremely well. It's clean and it's comfy, it's well appointed. Yes, yes, and it was one of the rules actually that the arms people had to abide by was to keep their house sweet, sweet smelling and, you know, keep it clean. That's the way it was described. They had to brush out every, every week or whatever. Can you show me there? Yes, let's go upstairs to um, the 19th century, the room we've displayed as if it were 19th century. And as we go up, we can admire again the traditional paint that we've used here and the liveliness that you get with the distemper. It's much less flat than an emulsion. So let's come through to this room, which is displayed as if it were the 1880s. My immediate reaction is it's much more ornate. Even the chamber pot is decorated. Indeed, yes. And I think two things have happened here, really. I mean, there is generally, by this period, much more stuff, much more stuff for people to buy. But also the social profile of the pensioners changes over the 19th century. So from the 1840s, you need to have five shillings a week guaranteed to be able to come and live here, as well as taking the ironmonger's um, pension. So that's one of the things that has changed. And we find also that it's more people, less of the local tradespeople coming to live here, and there tends to 
to be more sort of middle class people coming in who've perhaps worked as companions or governesses or school mistresses and then they've fallen on hard times. And what we know from the records of people who visited almshouses at this period is that there was a massive stuff in them that people had brought with them the things they had of old London opens in 1714 in what was then a semi-rural suburb and now an oasis of calm amid the bustle of ultra trendy Hoxton in the east of the city and housing the museum of domestic life the almshouses were founded in 1714 with a bequest from Sir Robert Jeffrey a wealthy London merchant to provide homes for the elderly poor there were 14 houses in all, which offered accommodation for around 50 pensioners. Each house had four rooms and the pensioners were allocated one room each. It was functional and austere, but much better than being on the streets. The museum's curator, Eleanor John, took me into one of the restored arms houses, laid out just as it would have been 200 years ago. So the almshouses opened in 1714, but this room is, we present it in the 1780s. So a little while the foundation had been open for a number of years. My name is Ronald Hutton, and I'm a professor of history at Bristol University and a commissioner of English heritage. All my life, I've had a passion for museums, and in this new series, I'm going to take you to a few of my own favorite little hidden gems. So whether it's ancient Egypt, Victorian London, or even human remains that pique your interest, I hope that this cornucopia of curiosities will tickle your fancy as much as it has done mine. Hello and welcome to the programme. This time we're at the Jeffrey Museum, set in one of the largest surviving arms houses. All my life I've had a passion for museums, and in this new series I'm going to take you to a few of my own favourite little hidden gems. So whether it's ancient Egypt, Victorian London, or even human remains that pique your interest, I hope that this cornucopia of curiosities will tickle your fancy as much as it has done mine. Hello and welcome to the programme. This time we're at the Jeffrey Museum, set in one of the largest surviving almshouses of old London opens in 1714 in what was then a semi-rural architectural service surfaces and then looking under that under a microscope we could establish what colors tended to be used and the colors that come through very strongly for most of the period that the arms houses are open are stones and buffs and grays and in this particular room we've got the paneling is painted with oil paint we had it specially made up. All the pigments that are used are natural, ones that would have been used at the time and had been used on the arms houses. The walls are um, distemper, which is a um, chalk, water, and animal glue, and again with some pigment. And then the ceiling is just what's called whitening, which is just rural suburb, and now an oasis of calm amid the bustle of ultra trendy Hoxton in the east of the city and housing the Museum of Domestic Life. The almshouses were founded in 1714 with a bequest from Sir Robert Jeffrey, a wealthy London merchant, to provide homes for the elderly poor. There were 14 houses in all, which offered accommodation for around 50 pensioners. Each house had four rooms and the pensioners were allocated one room each. It was functional and austere, but much better than being on the streets. The museum's curator, Eleanor John, took me into one of the restored arms houses, laid out just as it would have been 200 years ago. So 
So the almshouses opened in 1714, but this room is, we present it in the 1780s, so a little while the foundation had been open for a number of years. And what we try to do here is we try to recreate the space as authentically as possible. And one of the things we did was paint analysis, microscopic paint analysis of all the painted My name is Ronald Hutton, and I'm a professor of history at Bristol University and a commissioner of English heritage. 